know that you are having fun Good morning, everybody. Well, I guess afternoon now that it's noon. Um, can everybody hear me okay? I'm hoping so. Um, we're gonna go ahead and get started, like I said. Uh, welcome to day two of the Restoring the West Conference. For those of you who joined us yesterday, welcome back. For all the newcomers, my name is Gabrielle Hardin and I am the Forestry Extension Educator at Utah State University. If you have any questions for the speakers today during their presentations, please enter those into the Q&A box that you'll find a little spot for at the bottom of your Zoom platform. Um, I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Darren McAvoy to get us started. He is the Extension Assistant Professor of Forestry and the Chair of the Restoring the West Conference Planning Committee. Uh, Darren, go ahead whenever you're ready. Thank you, Gabrielle. Appreciate opening things up and welcome everybody to the 15th annual Restoring the West Conference. Uh, we're going virtual this year and adapting to the changing conditions. Um, we wish you could be in Logan with us today, although the skies are a little bit smoky. Uh, it's another beautiful day. Uh, we missed having you last night for uh, a social that never happened. It would have been great to see everybody last night. Really uh, missed that event, but uh, glad we can continue on in, in this virtual format and, and make the best of, of the situation we have. Uh, today, we get to continue our learning experience uh, at the Restoring the West Conference uh, regarding Aspen. We started studying Aspen at this conference in 2006 in the original event uh, held in Cedar City, uh, Utah. And we come back to this event every, or this topic every couple of years. It's super important. And I'm excited about how today's speakers are going to, again, further nudge our knowledge uh, just a little further. Uh, and each time over the years of Restoring the West, we've managed to do that um, in such ways that we even use different language. Uh, our, our understanding of Aspen has completely changed over uh, the course of, of this conference, not completely, but significantly, and uh, due in large part to the kind of speakers that we're going to hear from today, starting with Doug Shinneman. And we, uh, return, uh, we welcome Doug back to uh, the Restoring the West uh, stage, so to speak. Uh, Doug is going to talk to us today uh, from Boise. Doug uh, is a superver supervisory research fire ecologist um, in the USGS. And he's going to talk about the role of climate and fire in shaping aspen forests of the Great Basin, altered dynamics and management challenges. Uh, it's all yours, Doug. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes, loud and clear. And is my screen sharing properly? Okay. Yes, it sure yes, is. Thanks. Okay, well, thanks, everyone. I'd like, uh, I, I just want to say that I appreciate the opportunity to talk about Aspen Ecology in the, in the Great Basin. And um, by the way, I want to quickly acknowledge Susan McElray as a co-author um, on this presentation. She's been involved in much of the research that I'll be talking about today. So uh, I'll start by uh, discussing uh, recent Aspen fire trends and some general concepts about Aspen fire ecology. Uh, I'll provide some research findings. Um, uh, oops, one sec, sorry, one little technical thing here. Okay, uh, I'll provide some research findings about key Aspen climate relationships, uh, provide examples of disturbance interactions, and then discuss implications for the future of Aspen in the Great Basin and likely management challenges ahead. So here we can see the North American uh, distribution of Aspen and its sparse and isolated distribution in the Great Basin. Um, zooming in, we can see that these sparsely distributed Aspen ecosystems comprise somewhere between one and one and a half percent of the total Great Basin area. Uh, however, pure Aspen and mixed Aspen conifer forests uh, comprise um, roughly two thirds of all montane and subalpine forest area in the region. So it's a substantial component of the, of the forest cover area. Um, and you can also see the substantial recent fire history in the Great Basin with over 23 million acres burned in the region between 1984 and 2018. In fact, the area burned in Great Basin Aspen forests has increased significantly over the past 35 years, 
uh, roughly 300,000 acres of aspen habitat burned during that period, which equates to an average fire return interval of about 220 years. Uh, but if these trends continued, we'd expect fire-free intervals to continue to decrease into the future. Um, you know, however, aspen's a fire-adapted tree species, so will more fire uh, be beneficial to aspen? Uh, well, that depends on multiple factors, including the relative fire dependency of an aspen stand, uh, interactions with climate, including conditions that affect regeneration after fire, uh, interactions with other disturbance agents uh, like drought or excessive uh, herbivory, uh, and interactions with competitive species like conifers, but also those that might benefit from fire like non-native uh, grasses. So let's just kind of quickly review some basics of aspen fire ecology. Uh, most fires occurring in aspen can be considered high severity. Uh, fire, uh, or aspen, excuse me, are easily killed by fire, especially in mixed aspen conifer stands where crown fires are common. Aspen is considered highly fire adapted in part because it's often a prolific reproducer after fire. Uh, vegetative suckering from roots of aspen clones is its most common method of regeneration in the Western United States. Uh, but sexual reproduction also occurs, particularly where post-fire environments are conducive for seedling establishment and survival. Uh, aspen stands are often serial to other tree species, especially uh, conifers that can gradually replace aspen in the absence of fire. And thus many aspen stands are considered fire dependent. However, stable aspen stands that don't depend on fire are not uncommon, especially where conifer competitors are rare. So just let's kind of review those concepts in a little more detail. Um, an idealized successional trajectory for serial aspen includes four basic phases, a stand replacing fire event, uh, after which young and often even age stands of aspen develop quickly. Uh, as these aspen cohorts age, they gradually provide conditions favorable for recolonization uh, by shade tolerant conifers. As older stands become increasingly dominated by more mature conifers, aspen regeneration declines, and the stands become more fire prone, therefore repeating the cycle. And this cycle can create dynamic and spatially complex mosaics of aspen and conifer cover across landscapes. In contrast, stable or persistent aspen stands are generally considered self-sustaining, uh, in which the rate of mortality of older trees does not generally exceed the rate of successful recruitment of younger trees. And these are often pure aspen stands uh, with multi-cohort structures in which there's a negative exponential relationship between tree age and density. In other words, we have far more young trees than old trees. Um, and these kind of stands can, can persist um, uh, through a few different uh, mechanisms. Uh, the example there, number one, is through continuous or episodic recruitment through, for instance, canopy gap mortality caused by insects, disease, or aging trees. However, stands may also experience and recover from more extensive uh, overstory mortality, uh, as in the drought or insect killed stand uh, represented by number two, or through stand replacing fire events, as in number three. So, so it's not a matter of no disturbance. Uh, in, in persistent stands, but rather that a stand can persist through multiple generational rotations uh, without requiring a major disturbance event. In fact, we looked at these types of aspen stand dynamics in three mountain ranges in northern Nevada, uh, the Jarbidge Independence Mountain Complex, the Santa Rosa Mountains, and the Ruby Mountains. Uh, and pure aspen stands are common in these ranges uh, with upper montane conifer cover largely absent or rare with the notable exception of the central garbage mountains where subalpine fir has substantial cover. Uh, we sampled uh, just over hundred aspen sites using various forest mensuration and dendrochronology techniques for this study. And a key finding was that age and size class distribution suggest that aspen are largely self-replacing and stable in these mountain ranges. Uh, the figure at left indicates that aspen stands range from being quite old to relatively young uh, based on the oldest tree dated in each stand. However, the figure at right shows ample reproduction was, was occurring uh, with negative exponential relationships between age and density across each mountain range and for the study area as a whole. Uh, these age class distribution patterns were strongly consistent even among different aspen forest types. So whether we grouped them by pure aspen, riparian aspen, aspen conifer mix, we, st we still saw these relationships. And these same patterns were also uh, commonly exhibited among individual stands. 
So despite finding very little fire evidence in these stands, uh, and we searched for it during this study, uh, aspen are apparently self-sustaining at the landscape scale and, and mostly at the stand scale as well. Uh, similar findings have been reported elsewhere in the Great Basin, uh, but not in all cases, especially studies that focused on locations where conifer competitors were more abundant. So due to the absence of major fire events uh, that would have produced pulses of aspen regeneration through time, um, climate was clearly correlated with aspen establishment over time in these stands. And that included both temporally lagged and contemporaneous relationships. For instance, um, the figures at right illustrate how variability in the Palmer drought severity index, which is an index of relative dryness or moisture availability, and maximum spring temperatures um, clearly align with the variability in aspen establishment density over time, as indicated in the lower portion of that figure. And, and we can see that because the climate records have been realigned here, you know, visually, five years forward and one year back, respectively, um, to line up with those correlations with, with aspen establishment density by year. Um, other climate variables that we studied uh, for this research that aren't shown here had very similarly timed relationships, some cases equally strong, um, with aspen density by year. Uh, and we think this suggests that aspen clones in these stable stands are producing and storing carbohydrate reserves during more favorable, especially wetter climate periods. And subsequent drier and warmer conditions are promoting canopy mortality, which then induces suckering and sucker growth, in part by reducing apical dominance, but also by allowing more sunlight to reach the forest floor, and because these clones are able to capitalize on those stored energy reserves. Of course, other factors. Um, such as browsing of young aspen by wild and domestic ungulates could also affect aspen regeneration. In fact, we found a significant difference in the proportion of suckers reaching recruitment height between plots classified as either low or high browse in our study area. Uh, recruitment height is often considered to be around two meters because that's generally tall enough for aspen, young aspen to be less susceptible to mortality from browsing. Um, however, I should point out that excessively browsed stands were, were relatively rare in our sites among our sites and, and thus had a negligible impact on the landscape scale uh, rates of, of, of recruitment. In another study, we sampled aspen regeneration in various locations that had burned over the past five to 15 years previously, um, located throughout the Northern Great Basin and adjacent uh, portions of the Central and Northern Rocky Mountains. Uh, results from statistical models from this research strongly suggested that winter precipitation had positive effects on density, of, the both, of both the overall regeneration uh, you know, among all young trees, but also recruitment sized uh, young aspen. Um, and the early winter precipitation ratio um, circled at, at the top, but also in the lower graph as well, um, had the largest effect size. And, and this is a metric we developed that represents the ratio of average early winter precipitation during a five year post fire period to the long-term 30 year average, in other words, was the site wetter or drier than average during the post-fire period. And similar to the previous study, indicators of browsing pressure, in this case, pellet density of, of ungulates, also had a significant negative effect on recruitment densities. So studies like this uh, suggest that winter precipitation may be particularly important for aspens persistence, especially under climate change, and particularly in the Great Basin, which receives most of its precipitation during winter months. <clears throat> There's been a marked decline in snowpack across the Western US over recent decades. Um, and a recent study predicted that under projections of future warming, there will be substantial reductions in annual maximum snow water amounts uh, in the Northern Great Basin. And this could have consequences for Aspen stands that depend on melting snowdrifts for water subsidies uh, during the generally dry growing seasons that we get in the Great Basin. Uh, and these kind of aspen stands that exist in these sort of snow, snow dependent refugia are often called uh, snow drift dependent or snow pocket aspen. Shifting gears just a little bit, numerous studies are also predicting increasing fire activity in the Western US uh, under climate change over the next few decades. Uh, for instance, researchers found that the burned area in California over um, the 47 year period shown above increased by over 400%. Um, and that this increase was highly correlated with atmospheric vapor pressure deficit, which is a measure of atmospheric aridity. 
Um, the plot below shows that maximum temperatures from March to October have increased by over roughly 1.8 degrees Celsius or almost two degrees Celsius over the last 120 years, which corresponded to a 13% increase in vapor pressure deficit. So given these climate fire relationships, we should expect continued increases in fire activity in the future based on climate projections. And of course, this is one of many studies that have been showing these sorts of relationships and have been uh, predicting increased fire activity under climate change. So one way to explore hypotheses about the future of Aspen is to use disturbance and succession models, um, computer models that simulate interactions uh, between changing climates, uh, changing climate and fire regimes. Um, and I can only quickly summarize a few examples here, but in one study, my colleagues and I developed projections that suggested more fire under a warming climate might result in Aspen replacing some conifer forest at higher elevations, so potentially beneficial uh, in those locations, but where uh, climate was, uh, because climate was more likely to remain suitable at, at those elevations. Uh, but the fire could hasten Aspen's demise at lower elevations, uh, where climate scenarios suggested conditions would become increasingly less suitable, uh, especially for regeneration. In another modeling study, uh, we found that by simulating shifts in snowdrift water availability that might be expected from a hotter climate, uh, snowdrift dependent aspen stands are unlikely to receive adequate growing season soil water subsidies to support regeneration rates necessary for replacing aging and dying overstories. Of course, it's not just modeling. I mean, in addition to modeling, there's other reasons to think that low elevation aspen forests in particular are at risk due to changing climate and fire regimes. Uh, Great Basin rangelands that border low elevation aspen are already affected by changing climate and non-native flammable grasses that promote these extremely large, often called megafire events um, in the Western US. Um, for instance, the 2018 South Sugarloaf Fire in Northern Nevada burned nearly a quarter of a million acres, starting in Sagebrush Steppe, but then burning up into drought stressed aspen and conifer stands. And the ability of aspen stands to regenerate after such events will depend on multiple factors, such as the climate and browsing impacts after fire, but also the health of the stand before fire. So in the, in the picture at lower right, for instance, we can see a lower elevation aspen stand in Nevada uh, that suffers from multiple threats, including heavy browsing with almost no recruitment size young trees, an invasion of flammable cheatgrass into the understory, and encroachment of pinion and juniper trees. Um, these conditions could cause more severe or frequent burning, and if combined with continued browsing pressure or drought, the clone may lack the capacity to successfully regenerate, leading to wildfire-driven forest conversion. So what, what are the management challenges ahead, and what are some of the key factors to guide aspen conservation strategies? Um, well, I can't do it justice in one slide, but I'll just give a quick overview. Uh, we should expect uh, unique responses among different aspen types to changes in climate and fire regimes. For example, for example post-fire regeneration responses will likely vary among different aspen functional types, but also along elevational and moisture gradients. <clears throat> we should expect regional to local scale differences in climate change effects themselves, including um, diverse patterns of drought effects, diminishing snowfall or snowpack, uh, changes varying over space and time, and, and changes in climate-induced fire frequency. And this may present contradictory signals for land managers and adaptive management approaches may need to be constructed commensurately to, to adjust and, and, and account for this variability in, in, in the effect of climate change. Uh, we should also expect the unexpected as novel combinations of stressors become more likely, including unprecedented climate shifts and plant interactions that could fundamentally alter the role of fire and create less favorable conditions for post-fire aspen regeneration. And then lastly, um, these changes could lead to rapid and irreversible changes, including type conversion and aspen forest loss. So I suggest we need to better assess aspen vulnerability within different environments, which could help to prioritize conservation measures that are most likely to be effective over the long term. And um, that's it, just a quick acknowledgement to some of the funders who supported this past research, especially the Climate Adaptation Science Centers and our many partners among um, various institutions and the numerous field and lab techs who've worked on these projects over the years. Thank you. Thank you so much, Doug. Uh, we really appreciate you taking the time to be with us today. Um, if anybody has any questions, 
I do see one here. This is from Darren. Do these mm -hmm. findings apply outside of the Great Basin? Yeah, I think they do. I think a lot of these dynamics and a lot of these trends are occurring elsewhere. Um, I think one of the reasons, though, that the Great Basin makes such a unique place to study Aspen is that, um, you know, unlike other areas, again, there are many places where Aspen occur in pure stands. So there's an opportunity to really see how Aspen responds fairly uniquely uh, to these changes. Um, also, in the Great Basin, you know, there's really not much place for Aspen to go. It can go up in elevation, but there really is no opportunity for Aspen to migrate northward, as it might say, in more connected parts of the Rocky Mountains. Uh, and then just the heavy, you know, winter precipitation dominance of the region makes it a little more unique. So I, I do think a lot of the, the trends that are occurring are occurring elsewhere, of course, but, but the Great Basin does have some unique attributes that are worth exploring. Thank you. Does anybody else have any other questions for Doug? Um, any of our panelists could chime in and feel free to verbally ask him a question, or if anybody else has anything, you could put it in the chat. We've got one here that says, can you discuss the effects of landscape scale bark beetle mortality and mixed aspen conifer stands on surviving aspen stand dynamics? Yeah, well, that's a, that's a great question. It's not one that I've studied much. So I, um, I don't have a lot of firsthand experience with studying those systems. Uh, and perhaps the person who asked the question does. Um, you know, I think that in some cases, those um, bark beetle infested stands may be beneficial to Aspen over time. Um, but again, it's, it's not an area of research that I've, I've you know, really been involved in. So I'd, I'd be curious to see or hear from, from others on that one. Uh, Paul Rogers is gonna jump in and ask mm -hmm. you a question. Hey, Doug. Uh, nice presentation. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder if you could talk at all about um, direct impacts of drought. Um, uh, aside from fire, there's been much hay made outside the Great Basin about aspen trees and forests dying directly from drought. Mm -hmm. Do you have any thoughts on that in, in the Great Basin? Or yeah, outside? sure. With the sudden aspen dieback events and the concern about sort of range-wide aspen decline, and much of that I know has been linked to, to, to drought. Um, you know, I think drought continues to be a, um, a serious risk. Um, I don't know that the effects were perhaps as, as long lasting in some areas as, as was maybe initially expected, that there, have, there was some areas that have recovered from some of those drought effects. Um, but I, I think the larger concern is whether or not those sorts of um, um, wide scale um, drought impacts are gonna become more common um, and especially um, you know, uh, trying to get a pinpoint or trying to figure out exactly where those kind of things are going to be most detrimental to Aspen. You know, where is drought going to have the greatest impact? Um, where within its overall range, but also, you know, what topographic types of positions are more vulnerable? I know there's been studies that have shown that lower elevations and south facing slopes have been more vulnerable to drought, <clears throat> like in the Southern Rockies, but others have shown that that's not always the case, that there actually could be um, other aspects or other locations that could be equally vulnerable. Um, so I, I think that, you know, from my experience, the, the concern with drought is, um, you know, both, both short term in terms of, you know, these mortality events, but the bigger question is, you know, is this a, is this going to be a long-term trend? Should we expect more of this? And if so, um, you know, that, that obviously could have significant impacts on, on Aspen over the long term, um, given that it can be a fairly drought intolerant species. Okay, it looks like we have one more, um, and I'm wondering if the next speaker will actually touch on this as well. Oh, we've got another one popping. What do we know about Aspen establishment from seed in areas that were not already populated? Aspen establishment by seed? Yes, in areas yeah. that were not already populated. In areas not already populated by Aspen. Another great question. Um, of course, um, there's been uh, some really good recent work on this, some of the work that Karen Mock and others have done looking at um, sexual reproduction in Aspen. Um, it's a challenge in the field um, to, to sometimes uh, know for certain, you know, with, with stands that, have, that are more developed. Um, uh, I, I don't know. I have to, I, I guess I'd have to punt on that question because I really don't know, um, you know, to what extent um, seed dispersal um, in Aspen in the West 
is contributing to expansion of, of, of Aspen stands in areas that weren't formally populated and the potential for, for that uh, to occur, you know, in, in the face of, of climate change and changing disturbance regimes that could, in some cases, fire could open up habitat for Aspen that's not currently occupied and the ability to, um, you know, have, have a colonization of Aspen in those stands that didn't formally have Aspen populations would be obviously really valuable. So not, not much of an answer, but um, an important dynamic to consider. Well, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. And thank you for taking the time to answer these questions. Mm -hmm. um, we did get a couple more, but I'll save those until the very okay. end when we do our panel Q&A. Um, now I'm going to introduce Mark. He is our next speaker. Mark Creeder is a, an ecology master's student here at Utah State University. He earned his bachelor's in environmental science at Goshen College um, under the counsel of Dr. Larissa Yocom. He currently researches factors that influence post-fire forest regeneration. He spent time in the remote areas of Southern Utah, gathering data about native trees after a large forest fire and conducting experiments on factors that control the success of seedlings. So today he's going to discuss with us advances in Aspen regeneration ecology. Um, Mark, over to you. Great, thank you. Okay, I hope that is coming through well. My shared screen? Yes, it is. Great. Um, and thank you for, for the opportunity to talk at this conference today. I'm really excited to share some recent work. Um, and I think it's, it's a great segue um, from, from Doug's talk at that last question. Um, I think I have a few answers that are emerging um, to some of those, those last questions about seed, seed regeneration in Aspen. Um, so to, to start off with, Quaken aspen is a really important species for many reasons. Um, not only do we value these aspen forests for their beauty, and um, they often maintain higher levels of species diversity than nearby conifer forests. And at least anecdotally, um, aspen forests can act as natural fire breaks in the landscape. But of course, for these benefits to persist, aspen is dependent on adequate regeneration. And when most people think of aspen regeneration, something like this comes to mind, a dense sea of newly sprouted aspen. And this is the first form in which aspen can, can regenerate, like Doug mentioned. Existing roots send up a sucker, which is genetically identical to its parent clone. Now suckers can be prolific following a, a disturbance, and they tend to be the focus of most aspen regeneration research. They're widespread and, and hard to miss. And this regeneration method works great most of the time. However, with changing climate, um, it does present some limitations. For one, since genes are, are the same as the parent, um, there's really no opportunity for adaptation to changing environments. And there's also limited ability to, to migrate um, since suckers must re-sprout from existing root systems. However, aspen can also regenerate sexually through seeds. And a single tree can produce over a million of these tiny seeds in a, a given year. And some of them um, then germinate and grow in, in, into seedlings potentially. And of course, in contrast to suckers, which are genetically identical to their parent clone, a seedling origin aspen is a, a unique individual uh, genetically and contains a mix of genes from both its male and female parent trees. And this, this presents some benefits. Um, for one, sexual, sexual regeneration increases a genetic diversity and this creates adaptive capacity in the, the population with which to respond to climate change, as well as other selective pressures like pathogens or, or ungulate herbivory. Um, and secondly, the, the tiny seeds are, are wind dispersed and can travel distances up to 10 miles, um, greatly facilitating Aspen's ability to track changing climate um, and, and to colonize new, new areas that become suitable. There's also been great concern um, or concern in recent years over the potential, potential, potential decline of Aspen in the West. And in certain places, Aspen has been lost from the landscape. So seedling regeneration can, can recolonize these areas much quicker than suckers, um, again, due to how, how much further the seeds can, can disperse. And in a similar manner, Aspen seedlings may be able to fulfill ecological roles in places where conifer regeneration is increasingly reduced or non-existent due to a warming climate. Especially since it's the most widespread tree in North America, Aspen can do well in a range of locations and climates, making it a perfect candidate to, to pick up some of this slack. However, in spite of these advantages, on paper at least, um, 
Aspen seedling establishment has long been considered rare in the Western US and largely discounted. Uh, and this came from the untested assumption that it was just too arid in the Western US for seeds to germinate and survive. And so, and so we see very absolute statements in the literature of the time in the past century, such as Aspen is unable to reproduce by seed in the front range of Colorado. Or no fact of Aspen ecology in Utah at least seems more certain than the Aspen trees reproduce only through vegetative means. So in this context, it was enough to publish a paper on the discovery of a single Aspen seedling, um, which ironically occurred in, in Utah. Um, however, even when seedlings were found in large numbers, such as after the 1988 Yellowstone fires, it was seen as a rare event and largely attributed to favorable climate. However, in the following years, we've seen many other occurrences of seedling establishment that have been documented, including after nearly every subsequent fire in Yellowstone. And these, these together have forced us to reconsider some of our previously held assumptions about Aspen seedlings and their role in the Western US. However, compared to suckers, seed-based regeneration has still received much less attention. And a recent review of the current state of knowledge puts it well, that information on seed regeneration in Aspen tends to be scattered, somewhat anecdotal, or based only on localized research efforts. And as a result, there are many knowledge gaps, especially in the areas of establishment and early survival. And so much of my work in the last couple of years has been to, to, to address these knowledge gaps. Um, and I'd like to share a few elements of the story that, that is currently emerging. So the first step was to conduct a meta-analysis of documented cases of seedling establishment in Aspen. And most of these have occurred in the last 40 years, following disturbances such as fire, um, which provide excellent conditions for seed germination. And in addition to covering a large geographical range, um, these sites also span a, a range of climate. Now on the right here is the climate envelope of Aspen's distribution in the West. So these are the combinations of annual mean temperature and um, precipitation in which Aspen occur. And climate of sites with seedling establishment um, spans much of this, this envelope. We don't have any sites below 500 millimeters of annual precipitation. Uh, however, these occurrences were all opportunistically identified. So th this threshold could just reflect a lack of any studies that have actually occurred in these drier areas, such as, as Nevada. Now we can also look at the climate in specific years of, uh, of a seedling establishment. Um, so for example, we can look at whether the precipitation in the year of establishment was below or above average for each site. And what we find is that seedlings establish across the board, um, some in wet years, others in dry years. And this pattern holds for all other climate variables that we tested. I mean, you can see on the left, a few of those. Um, and, and together shows that seedlings are certainly not restricted only to years of favorable climate. However, even if seedlings can establish across a range of climate, it doesn't necessarily show that they're common. After all, there have only been several do dozen documented occurrences in the entire last century. And so this summer, we set out to, to get a better handle on how common seedlings really were, at least after fires. So we, uh, we, we defined a search area shown here in red and identified all fires that burned in 2018 within within this area in, in areas that had pre-fire Aspen or, or could, could support Aspen based on their, their climate. And this, this yielded 15 fires um, spanning a range of about 500 miles. And we then traveled to each of these 15 fires and established randomly located plots and, uh, and surveyed for the presence of Aspen seedlings. So in these plots, we, we needed a way to differentiate seedlings from suckers since they're the same species um, and become essentially indistinguishable after only a few years of growth. And there are a number of factors, including the presence of, of, bud, of opposite bud scars, as in this photo. Um, and you can read more about um, all the ways to tell them apart in a recent methods paper that we, we published. However, importantly, um, the important thing is that we demonstrated high levels of, of accuracy, meaning that in the field, in this study that I, I just laid out in the last slide, we could go out into the field highly confident of when we, we did, in fact, find seedlings. And of these 2018 fires that we surveyed, we found Aspen seedling establishment in about 80%, right, exactly 80%. And 
And, and overall, about 12% of plots had aspen seedling regeneration. This, this uh, percentage varied greatly within fires, with some fires having only a single plot occupied, um, while others had over 60% of plots with seedling establishment. Densities also varied greatly. Um, in occupied plots, the median density was only one seedling per 100 meters squared. Um, however, in several fires, we found seedlings in much higher densities, up to nearly 100 seedlings per plot. So I've just presented some results on establishment patterns across broad scales, um, which, which show that seed, aspen seedlings are fairly, fairly ubiquitous. Um, however, we've also attracted, we've also intensively tracked seedlings within a single fire over time. And we, we did this in the Brian Head Fire, which burned in Southern Utah in 2017, um, and then had prolific aspen seedling establishment the following year. And within this fire, we've tagged over a thousand seedlings and plots um, spanning a range of elevation and tracked their growth and mortality um, over the following two growing seasons. So because seedlings can't make use of those, those shared clonal root resources like suckers do, they, they don't grow quite as fast. Um, however, in the two growing seasons that we've tracked them, they've certainly made steady progress. Uh, they currently have a mean height of 18 centimeters um, at the, as of this past, past month, um, and some even are approaching one, one meter. Now that is certainly under the, the browse height uh, that affects them, and it, it does take a while for them to, to attain heights relative to suckers. However, we, did, we didn't find our bravery to be a large driver of mortality um, or, or suppressed growth, at least at, at this stage. And part of this may be because it's just a, a very large fire um, with extensive sucker uh, sucker regeneration as well. And so our bravery pressures are, are spread pretty thin across the fire. After two growing seasons, about 37% of seedlings are still alive. Uh, however, survival appears to be stabilizing as seedlings attain more self-sustaining heights and, and diameters. And this pattern does mirror our findings in, in other studies where seedlings initially experience fairly high mortality, but a portion make it through to more, more mature stages. And part of this, this mortality is being driven by interspecific competition with other seedlings. Um, Aspen's reproductive strategy is to create many more individuals than will eventually survive, such as in this photo on the right. And this, this, I mean, this means a lot of seedlings die, but it also allows natural selection to, to select for seedlings that are best adapted to site conditions. A, a bigger factor impacting survival appears to be competition with, with suckers. So with the, the um, vegetative re-sprouting form of aspen. Um, and, and that's probably because these grow much faster and can shade out the smaller seedlings. Um, we, we showed that sites with highest densities of suckers had four and a half times lower survival than sites with, with none, none at all, which is a pretty big impact. So this, this means that while seedlings may not do well in this environment with massive competition from suckers, they may do much better in areas without pre-fire aspen, such as this photo. And in this sense, seedlings and suckers uh, both play important roles, with suckers maintaining existing stands with, and well, well, seedlings can then colonize new, new areas. Um, and in fact, in the 2018 fires that we sampled across the Intermountain West, over half of plots with aspen seedling establishment had no pre-fire aspen presence, meaning that, that they, they were expanding the area that aspen occupied. So to sum up these findings, we're learning that aspen seedlings are, are much more common across space, time, and climate than we previously assumed. Um, though there may be high initial mortality, many seedlings remain, and they're likely better adapted to their conditions. And finally, we see that competition is detrimental to seedlings. However, they do much better in areas with no suckers or pre-fire aspen. Aspen seedlings have likely always played an important role in Western forests, even if we weren't, weren't aware of it. Um, however, they may be all the more important into the future. For one, aspen seedlings can help facilitate adaptation to changing climate and allow migration to more suitable locations. Recolonization of areas where aspen has been lost is much more feasible with seedling origin aspens. And they may even help us to pick up the slack in, in forested areas um, where conifer regeneration is lacking. There's also been a recent push to use planted aspen seedlings as a restoration method. 
And the more we can learn about natural seedling establishment, uh, the more effective these facilitated techniques like planting can be. And finally, I, I encourage you to look for aspen seedlings. I think this is a really important, important uh, take home point, especially if you work in areas of recent disturbance. There's a good chance that they're out there, um, but they're just hard to, to differentiate. And so this methods paper that I mentioned earlier can be a really helpful resource in telling them apart. Uh, and we'd love to hear from you if you know of any occurrences of seedling establishment or if you find any in, in the future. Um, and if you'd like to learn more about this research, I'll be presenting my, my master's thesis on December 10, in which I'll go in depth on, on these findings as well as, as many more. Um, so please, please email me if you'd like to watch the live stream. And with that, I'd like to, to thank the many people who've put lots of time and energy into this research and I'm, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mark, for that very informative presentation. Uh, we have a question from Stefan. How do you think seedling recruitment will change with the changing climate? Do you expect Aspen to establish in completely new ranges? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that the great thing about Aspen seedling establishment is that um, you have you have a whole, whole toolbox of, of, of genes and stuff. And so I think going into the future, if, if there's climate that is, is poor for sucker regeneration or for the sort of the, the previous um, the previous climate that the forests were established or that were, were adapted to, I think seedlings represent a great way, um, a great way to, to adapt to, to future climate. Um, and so, so yeah, so I think I think they're they're a great resource going into the future. We don't know much about long-term survival just because it's been understudied, but I think if survival can be um, maintained or is successful, then they're a great resource. Wonderful, thank you. This question is from Peter. Would you expect to see the same levels of aspen regeneration from seed following implementation of prescribed fire in an aspen stand? That, that's a great, great question. Um, I think one big area that we don't know much about is, is what controls the actual seeding in aspen trees. So why, why some years it might be a really big seeding, seeding year and other years there's, there's not as much. And so I, I think that's an area that we need to do more research in. Um, and that would have a big, big impact on whether or not seeding establishment would be predicted after, um, predicted after a, a prescribed fire like that. I think it comes down a lot to whether the seed is present. Thank you. This one is from Alan. Did your study address different site factors such as fire intensity, bare soil, shading, et cetera, for establishment of aspen seedlings? And if so, what can summarize these results? Yeah, well, the, 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 the most important takeaway is that seedlings basically only establish on, on burned areas. Um, I think I, we over the, the thousand tag seedlings, not a single one occurred on an area that hadn't burned. Um, so it's important to, to have burned soil. So then there's, there's also a, a threshold of high, high severity sites. Um, I guess, yeah, you have to be somewhat close to aspen seed establishment. It can travel up to 10, 10 miles, like I mentioned, but it does generally help to be closer to, to live forest. Um, although this isn't as strong of an effect as with conifer seedlings. Um, also, one other thing with site characteristics, and we, we did see higher establishment in, um, with higher elevation. Um, so it appears that seedlings do a little bit better in maybe cooler, drier temperatures. Thank you. And I think that may have answered Eric's question, which was, what are the environmental conditions needed for seedling establishment? So it sounds like you answered that. Well, yeah, and I just put in, I guess we, it's still an area that we're learning more about, but it doesn't appear that they're nearly as restricted as we, we once thought. Thank you. Um, William would like to know, does the soil type have an effect on regeneration by seed? That's a great, great question. Um, the, the simple answer, I think, is that they need bare, bare mineral soil is best um, since the tiny seeds don't have a ton of resources to, to push through large layers of organic material. In terms of more specific or more precise kind of delineations of soil type, we haven't done research into that, um, but I think it'd be a great future direction. Well, thank you so much for taking time to present with us today and for answering these questions. Um, if anybody else has any additional questions, feel free to enter those and we'll ask Mark in a little bit. Right now, we're going to move on with Shelly and David. Shelly Deich will be joined by David Mallet to give our final presentation. They both work with the South Dakota Department of Game, Fish and Parks. Shelly has been with the agency for 20 years as a habitat biologist. 
She has spent a considerable portion of her career in range ecology, vegetation monitoring, and wildlife habitat needs. <clears throat> she also specializes in NEPA and serves as the agency's liaison to the Forest Service within South Dakota. David has been with the agency for six years as a habitat biologist. He has a background in both forestry and wildlife management and specializes in forested ecosystems. So whenever you guys are ready, go ahead and take over. Oh, it is? But how come it's not the show? There we go. Um, can, can everybody hear us, hear me? Yes. Okay. All right, sorry for the, the weird camera angle, but we're in a split room or we're in a room. Um, so we're gonna talk about Aspen treatments in the Black Hills of South Dakota. Shelly, you might wanna switch the view so that we see the, the big screen. If you go up to the display settings and swap the view, then we'll have the full. Do you know which one she oh, needs? Display settings. display settings. And what do we do? And then swap presenter view and slideshow. Perfect. Is that right? Yes, it's perfect. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So is that, that's good. They don't see that, right? Yeah. Okay. All right. We'll try this again. Uh, Black Hills occur in Western South Dakota and Eastern Wyoming and are an isolated easternmost extension of the Rocky Mountains. It's a forested ecosystem which is surrounded by a sea of grass known as the Northern Great Plains. The Black Hills is a unique ecosystem which has a mix of eastern, western, southern, or northernmost extension of flora and fauna. And what I mean by that is if you're an avid birder, you're gonna go out with your western field guide and your eastern field guide. And we are, um, the Black Hills is a disturbance-based ecosystem which sets it up nicely for species like Aspen. However, Aspen in the Black Hills is on the fringe of its Rocky Mountain range. In the stands in South Dakota of the Black Hills, they're relatively small, less than 20 acres or so. Now there's exceptions to that where we have higher precipitation, deeper soils, or have had landscape altering wildfire in the last 20 years. The forest community here is primarily ponderosa pine as the dominant conifer and followed by Black Hills white spruce and a few other smaller um, abundances of conifers. And then lastly, we have our hardwood component which includes aspen birch and other hardwood species. The Black Hills is incredibly accessible to humans. And so we have post-European settlement influences, which also end up influencing the abundance and distribution of Aspen here. For example, we have the loss of and changes to disturbances, both spatially and temporally, such as fire. Uh, forest management priorities favor ponderosa pine because it's a commercial species. And it's been estimated by Dr. Dale Bartos that we have lost probably 60% of our historical distribution and abundance of aspen here in the Black Hills. And lastly, the other change is we have a lot more hungry mouths out there than what was probably here historically, which leads to our discussion of herbivory and uh, the need to conserve and protect aspen as much as possible. So those hungry mouths include elk, deer, and livestock. It's been shown in the research that if Aspen is browsed greater than 30% of its current year's growth, it contributes to a shrubby growth form of Aspen or even Aspen decline. And you can see in this photo that the Aspen here just cannot get out of the reach of the hungry mouths and will probably stay in that shrubby form. So today we're gonna let you know some of the public land treatments that we have um, tried here in South Dakota, and most of them are socially acceptable. But before you do any kind of treatments, you really need to know what is it that you want to do. Make sure you ask yourself that, find your goals and objectives, and is that treatment appropriate for what you want to do? And remember that not all Aspen clones respond equally. So what worked for you in one area may not work for you in another. 
There's just so many variables out there. So the most common kind of treatment that we do here in the Black Hills is total conifer removal. Uh, the picture starting on the left to the bottom center is the same area over a six year period where all commercial and non-commercial conifer were removed. Now, having said that, there's a separate discussion for another day on why we wanna retain um, big, large legacy conifers. Uh, they have their role in the ecosystem too, and they're also aesthetically pleasing, but that's another discussion. Another co common um, treatment is conifer slashing, but with a little twist to it. The picture here is 16 years post slash treatment in an area of the Black Hills. Uh, we piled the slash quite high, and the purpose is you want to create a barrier to those hungry mouths, to the animals that are gonna try to get in there and to get that uh, aspen regeneration. There's a caveat, you can pile too much slash on there. And what you've done then is you've shaded the forest floor too much and that aspen needs that solar radiation to get regenerated and the sprouts to get up. So in a lot of areas, there's best management practices for slash where you take it down to less than 18 inches so that it will more quickly melt into the forest floor and not be a fire hazard. However, that's the exact rule that we want to uh, violate because we want to keep that slash high. We want to barricade the animals and we want it to stay out there as long as possible. So you're gonna have to talk to your fire specialist and communicate with them and let them know that yes, there, there could be a short-term fuel load risk, but the benefits are that you'll have a long-term hardwood stand or hopefully you will. And then when fire does come through, it carries so much differently through a hardwood stand than it does through conifer or even a mixed stand. So the results of slashing, leaving it well above 18 inches can be highly variable. As you can see in this photograph, for whatever reason, uh, the slash did not stay on the ground long enough. Uh, the aspen did not respond like we were hoping and uh, made for a perfect meadow for two bull elk here in the foreground. And there is a cow way back there in the background. You can also exclude large animals, and this is not something that is uh, practical on a large landscape basis, but the purpose of doing this is you can really find out what the potential is of an area and to see what the recruitment would be have, had you not have um, high herbivory in the area. Um, the picture on the right, on the extreme right, you can see that fence with different shrub species just um, pushing against the fence line <clears throat> if we hadn't put that fence up, we would have never known that we had some of the shrub species that we have in this area. And outside the fence, you can see that you can see through the stand, which means that the reproduction is not being allowed to recruit to um, a level above uh, herbivory line. Uh, barbed wire fences, not so much uh, a good treatment. At best, if you had a really small area, you could use a four strand barbed wire fence. It's not going to keep the deer out, but it might keep elk out. There's anecdotal suggestion that elk do not jump into small exposures. You can also do deer or bird netting. Uh, we tried this on public land. I don't encourage it on public land. Too many people messed around with it. They didn't know what it was. Um, I think it's best suited for private land. It's high maintenance. It's temporary and animals can collide with it. You don't want a male animal uh, running down the forest road with a veil of netting on his antlers. So you have to be pretty cognizant of where you're putting this. Another type of exposure is a buck and pole fence at a four foot height. It will not keep out deer or elk, but it will keep out cattle. Uh, this is more of a treatment that is more aesthetically pleasing. Maybe you could put this up in a high visibility area. People don't seem to like wire fences. Uh, to look at. This is the same area <clears throat> on the left is six years after the fire and on the right is the same area 14 years later. If you look at the picture on the right, it looks like we literally corralled up the aspen and fenced them in, um, but that's not true. We plopped these fences down in a sea of aspen shoots after a fire, <clears throat> but there's a lot of herbivory going on in this area. You can extend that fence up to six foot high, which will keep out the larger deer and elk. 
Uh, the only warning is we did not put the poles down low enough to the ground the first year and the deer just scurry under there and uh, found quite a nice uh, solitude in that exposure. But this is the same picture before and after six years later after a fire and it certainly does the job. Notice on these exposures that I'm showing you that there are no aspen outside of these exposures and we did plop these down, these fences down within a sea of aspen shoots. Another method that is used um, in a lot of different places, especially the lake states or the northeast where uh, aspen is almost like a different beast, is the coppice or clear cut. And while it's civil culturally an acceptable method to treat aspen, I really do not, um, I don't support it here for the Black Hills. We are a much different ecology. Um, the response to aspen here is so different uh, from one site to another. Um, when we have all these other different kinds of treatments we can use, I would use them as an insurance policy so that you don't have an unfortunate loss of the entire clone. On the left was private land and the clone was lost. On the right, we did a really small patch clear cut in a stand of um, kind of stagnant aspen. And unfortunately, we didn't get the response we wanted and um, we created a really nice secure meadow for uh, large animals to, to browse there. So for the Black Hills anyway, I really would not recommend this treatment. Okay, so I'm going to talk about hinging. Um, so hinging is kind of an alternative method that we use here on the Black Hills, as opposed to some of our exposure fencing. And it's similar to a slash treatment, except that it's um, you're just making one cut on the tree with the objective of tipping that tree over so the top hits the ground and you form kind of this um, natural obstruction. Um, so you can use this as a fence-like structure around the perimeter of an aspen stand or um, like we do most of the time, uh, just and we have lots of ponderosa pine commonly in our aspen stands is to uh, hinge all those trees in the stand and then that'll form a, a barrier throughout the stand as well as um, these regenerating aspen that you kind of see in this picture, maybe a little tough to see, but those aspen will grow up through those branches and alongside the trunk. And not many animals will want to get their faces inside those branches. So that forms kind of a browse protection for, for those seedlings. Um, so this was a method developed out here in the early 2000s by Croto and Bartos, a uh, paper published in 2010. And they found that one of the biggest advantages of this method is that it's a lot cheaper than your um, fencing, whether it's a livestock fence or your eight foot tall wildlife exposures, which can cost as much as $6,500 per acre that they found. So hinging, they discovered, was around $200 an acre, um, so significantly cheaper. Uh, another advantage is that the material is already on site. You don't have to bring in um, any extra materials. All you need are the chainsaws and the folks to run it. Disadvantages, you know, fencing, as long as it's in good repair, can be pretty close to 100% effective at keeping browse, browsing animals outside of an area. Um, you know, hinging is not going to be that as effective. You're going to have small gaps in there where the trees don't meet, um, where animals are just going to push their way through. But overall, it's, it's still a pretty effective method of keeping most animals out. And one other thing we like to bring up is that, um, you know, this is a little bit more of a technical um, cut with a chainsaw, and so we do highly recommend someone um, doing this who has some experience running a chainsaw on fallen trees. So what is a successful hinge? So the picture on the left is um, a successful hinge. It's just one back cut on the tree, leaving as much wood as possible to form that hinge where the trunk still remains attached to the stump. And we like that about um, four to five feet high above the ground. So it kind of forms that visual obstruction kind of eye level to any animal that's going to be walking into that area. Uh, the picture on the right is obviously a failed hinge where the tree um, broke off at the hinge. And it may be a failed hinge, but it's not necessarily a, a failure to keep animals out of there. It's kind of like a slash treatment now where that trunk and branches are on the ground and still going to be somewhat of a deterrent, deterrent for animals wanting to get into that area. So how do you actually hinge a tree? Um, I like to start and say that um, don't fight the tree. So if 
it's already leaning in one direction or has heavy branches on one side, that's typically the, uh, the, the way the tree is gonna fall. And so you make one back cut. I like to do an angled back cut. Um, I feel that gives a little higher probability to um, leave more wood to have a successful hinge, as well as gives your wedges more leverage. So I do highly recommend using uh, wedges with this method and to insert that wedge as soon as you can behind the bar on your chainsaw. I like to cut about two thirds of the way through the tree and then slow down and start taking a little bit of wood at a time and pounding in that wedge and kind of going back and forth until that tree starts to tip. And with the idea being that the more wood left for that hinge, uh, the, the better chances you are you're gonna have a successful hinge. Uh, a few hinging notes that we have. Uh, there, we have found there's a difference between uh, when the sap is flowing and when it's not. So with that sap flowing, um, the tree is typically going to be a little, a little more flexible, so you have a better chance of having a good hinge. And see this tree here was hinged in the winter, and while it still did hinge, it's just barely on there, and so it's not going to last as long as if it was um, done during a different time of year. Uh, there is a difference between small and larger trees, so the smaller trees typically have a better chance of hinging. Larger trees, especially if you get into really bigger trees, just have more weight to them. Um, less likely to hinge and partially because when that top hits the ground, there's a lot more force and stress on that hinge. And sometimes it, it just breaks when it hits the ground. Um, aesthetics uh, can be an issue for some folks. So if you like your habitat management projects to look neat and orderly and kind of park-like, this may not be the, the technique for you. Um, one of the big themes with this is to make kind of nasty and uninviting looking as you can to those animals that they want to think twice about going into this area and find, a, find an easier meal. Uh, if you loading uh, may be an issue, uh, so you are dropping uh, more trees in the area. Uh, typically we do this in pretty um, smaller scale areas, so it hasn't been um, too big of an issue. And then additionally, you know, if you do have successful aspen regeneration, you're gonna have that hardwood component that's typically a little lower fire risk than, than our conifer dominated stands that we have out here. So long-term, def definitely a better um, idea for, for fire risk. And one other note for hinging is that um, we kind of say sometimes that this is kind of an art form as well as a science and that the layout of the hinging trees for a project is, is, is important to think about before and during uh, the project. Uh, just trying to determine you know, how animals are going to be getting into your area and planning accordingly on, on how and where to drop, drop these trees, as well as trying to minimize um, the number of uh, aspen seedlings that you're going to be dropping trees onto. That can be an issue as well sometimes. And so in summary, uh, if you're thinking about doing some aspen uh, treatments, you know, first you need to ask what do you want, think about your long-term um, long goals or make sure you have goals and, and the objectives set up. Um, how big is the treatment area? You know, we have lots of hunger mouths in our area out here. And so browsing pressure is always um, an issue for us. And we like to think of um, you know, swapping the system if we're gonna have enough regenerating aspen that is going to kind of overwhelm all of our browsers, which is hardly the case for us out here. And so we have to think about some sort of browse mitigation when we're doing our aspen treatments. Um, so a few of the things we covered today, um, you know, something that's done a lot on here is the conifer removal. Uh, it's pretty basic. You're just removing all of your conifer competition as well as your adjacent seed source to try and keep those um, um, pine and spruce out of there as long as you can. Um, exclosures are popular. Uh, there's a high upfront cost and you have some maintenance over time and they'll typically be out there long term, but they are very effective as browse deterrents. And then there's also um, using your natural materials, your slashing treatment as well as your hinging that's uh, very cost effective and not as um, browse deterrent as some other methods like exclosures, but definitely in the right situations can work. And with that, um, yeah, I, that's all that we have. So I guess we have time, we can take some questions. All right, thank you so much. We actually have quite a few questions. Um, a couple of people actually inquired about um, Ips bark beetle activity. And so have you noticed secondary bark beetles attacking the hinging trees? 
the hinge? Um, I guess the stuff I haven't, no, we haven't. Um, we I typically don't see as big of an it's issue out here. We do have them in the Black Hills, um, even across the state line here more in the Wyoming Black Hills, but we haven't had an issue with um, big spark beetle. Um, you know, unfortunately, I talked about the difference between the sap flow and dormant season. Just with the way our projects and timing works out, we typically do our hinging more in the dormant season. We don't get as good at um, hinging success, but it still it still works. Um, and so we don't always have that threat during that time of the year with the hips coming. Thank you. Um, do you find any trade-offs in conifer removal with mature aspen retention? such as longer fence maintenance timeline, lower than potential sprouting response, greater hiding cover for herbivores? Hmm. That's, that's a multiple question. I'm not really sure where to start. Um, Trade-offs, well, first of all, if, if you're talking about the ecology, let's talk about birds and species that depend on hardwoods. Um, hardwoods here in the Black Hills are very uncommon and in, are in very small, um, patches distributed across the landscape. There's not a lot of connectivity. So we don't have an increase in bird um, diversity because of the conifer. Any of those kind of birds are already are, are already here. Um, so we really need those, those hardwood stands. So trade-offs, I guess, ecologically speaking, it's much more important to have those hardwoods because it's the second most diverse ecosystem here in the Black Hills, riparian areas being first. Um, I'm not sure what other questions there were on that one. That was kind of a loaded bunch of questions. Did we answer that? I think so. Yeah, you spoke, you touched on some trade-offs, so that's good. Um, someone is wondering at what is the ideal height for the hinge cutting? Yeah, so we like to do it about four to five feet above the ground. Um, and that's just kind of keep it as a, a visual obstruction and kind of vaguely eye level for a lot of the animals that are going to be walking in there. So they can kind of see that um, hinge tree hanging up in the air as opposed to, you know, just on the ground. It's a little harder to see and they're just kind of that right in their face. That thing. Oh, when you hinge that high up, that's why David keeps talking about you need a very experienced sawyer. You don't want it to barber chair. Um, this is not something for the average sawyer. You really need to be cognizant and know what you're doing. It, it can be dangerous. Um, and also what David was talking about with the height, we had an area where some folks did some hinging, but they only did it a foot off the ground. And that kind of defeats the whole purpose of keeping out um, those long-legged elk. Now that might keep out a cow, but it's not gonna keep the deer in the elk way. So the higher, the better. Thank you. And yes, very good note on making sure that you're experienced before you start doing that kind of thing. I'm going to move into the panel Q&A portion so we can get some questions for everybody mixed around. Um, I'm first going to put out a poll. If you were here yesterday, that would be great if you could go ahead and um, if you just disregard that, but if today's your first day, please um, go ahead and fill out these questions for us. We would really appreciate it. Um, I'm going to go and shoot a question to Doug. Give me just a moment, let me pull that up. All right, Doug, if you're ready, are there any resources or publications you can suggest for land managers to use to help restore the Aspen and recently burned areas of mixed Aspen Ponderosa areas? Yeah, I saw that question earlier. I was kind of hoping our last talk would <laughs> cover that. And I think they did talk about it quite a bit. Um, so I think that's really highly relevant to, uh, to the previous talk. Um, otherwise, you know, I, there have been a few studies on Aspen Ponderosa ecology, of course, in the Black Hills and some of the interactions. But in terms of actual applied restoration, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not familiar with, with um, what's currently available, what, what the latest and greatest is. And maybe somebody else can take that. Does anybody else want to comment on that? I can repeat the question. Um, are there any resources or publications you can suggest for land managers to use to help restore the Aspen and recently burned areas of mixed Aspen Ponderosa forests? 
Uh, this is Shelley. I can't think of any uh, anything offhand. I would have to do some literature search, but the biggest thing is if you can keep the domestic uh, livestock out of there for at least two years, um, you, it's going to be really hard to control those those wild ungulates. But we did go in after a big burn here, and we tried hinging, and the trees were were burned too bad that they didn't hinge, but um, the smaller diameter ones, we actually lifted up and put them on the post and created this artificial kind of hinge. Okay, that's labor intensive. You can't do that across a landscape. But the biggest thing is um, to try to control those animals, at least here in the Black Hills. Thank you. Um, this one is for Shelly and David as well. Do snowmobilers ever hit the stumps of these hinged trees? Not that I am aware of. Our projects are yeah, we have pretty designated snowmobile trails out here. Um, you don't hear too many going off road. Um, and our snowpack typically doesn't get that high. I mean, if we're hinging four to five feet above the ground, it's, that's very rare to have snow. So they'd be pretty visible, so. Yeah. Yeah, the snowmobile activity out here is pretty controlled designated trails, you can go off road, but when they do, they, they don't go through the forest, they tend to go through big open meadows. So um, that's a great question, but <clears throat> if you're gonna hit those, um, it'd be like trying to, you know, you it's like a fence post, you're gonna hopefully be able to see it and it's gonna be such a mess, but I, I don't think that they would try to go through there. Thank you, um, this one could really go for anybody. If all other variables are equal, are there significant differences in aspen regeneration between high severity disturb fire disturbances and silvicultural treatments such as patch cuts? Is there differences between them? If all other variables are equal, are there significant differences in aspen regeneration between high severity fire disturbances, and silvicultural treatments, such as patch cuts. Mark, maybe you have some experience with this. You might want to jump in. Hate to put you on the spot. I, I mean, yeah, I, I don't have as much experience with, with treatments. Um, but my, my understanding is that the, I mean, anything that would stimulate the uh, suckering response, I would imagine, would be fairly, fairly equal. In terms of, of seeding establishment, I imagine that um, soil has, has to be a, some disturbance that affects the soil and and clears out some some amount of organic material whether, whether that's a fire or other forms of construction um, or scraping away soil is, is also suitable um this is this is shelly in the black hills uh, we have had severe fires um, but we've seen more aspen come up through those um, and be able to um, get up and out of the reach of herbivory. Now you're saying all things being equal. Um, again, there is such variability in the aspen here in the Black Hills between the Southern, Central and Northern Hills between precipitation, uh, soils, probably their own genetics that um, like I said earlier, we would not do, I would never recommend again doing a patch cut after we've tried it and it, and it failed for multiple reasons. Um, and because we have so little aspen on the landscape, for us here in the Black Hills, it's just not worth trying to do a patch cut. Um, but the, you, you said all things being equal, um, the biggest thing is to keep those animals out of there. And then we can't control the environmental factors. Thank you very much. Um, for Shelly and David, do you think that hinging is a good, a good method for the Great Basin area and the West where fire is more frequent? Yeah, I think so. Um, you know, you'd have to, we try to consult with our fire experts, fire specialists uh, to get their input. Um, you know, I'm not as familiar with the Great Basin area as much. Um, but I think in the right situation, it's just like any other treatment. You've got to weigh the pros and cons of it. Make sure you do your um, do your research for it and um, consult some other folks and um, just kind of weigh the advantages and, and disadvantages. I can see it 
definitely being applied in the right situations. Yeah, I mean, if the area is really prone to fire, whether the trees are, uh, the conifers are standing and are alive, but it's in a mixed stand, it's still gonna carry fire. And granted, you'll have different fuel load on the ground with those hinge trees because they're dead now. But even if that hinge treatment was out there maybe five, six years before a fire, at least you've given those aspen five, six years to get up and out of the reach. Um, and the fire maybe may act differently than in those hinge treatments. We've never measured anything like that where, where a fire went through an already hinged area. Um, but I say, try it, why not? It's, it, it's inexpensive and um, it sure beats the cost of fencing. Thank you. Um, is there a maximum number of hinged trees per acre? Yeah, maybe. I, I guess I, I don't know for sure. I've been kind of curious about that myself because you can get into a kind of situation with like a shell nest and a flash tree where you have too much shading of the soil if you're trying to get uh, senior and regenerating aspen. So that could be an issue. Um, the way I haven't seen that too much, we usually um, have a pretty good response. And it's just um, what you're comfortable with as far as how many hinge trees you want out there and how many you think it's going to take to deter. Um, the vast majority of animals getting into your site. Yeah, so with hinging, you're basically taking advantage of whatever materials are on site. So it depends on how dense your stand is and how big the trees or small the trees are. Also, when you fell the tree, the idea is not just the height off of the hinged stump, but you've got the top of the tree, which is going to be broad and try to keep animals out of poking their nose into those sharp needles. Um, to try to get a bite. So every conifer is going to have kind of a different configuration and amount of biomass that's going to be falling. So those are really good questions. Um, like David said, it's art and a science. The best thing you can do is try to think about where those animals are going to be walking, like from a road or down through a, a draw, a pass. You've got to think like an animal and, and they usually take the path of least resistance. So if you can fell your trees directionally like David was talking about, um, rather than putting them all in one area, that would also help keep some of that solar radiation going into the ground, but that's a really good question. It's just so variable from site to site. Thank you. Um, this one is for Mark. They enjoyed your discussion on seeded aspen. Curious about what, what you know about the seed itself. Length of variability, could it potentially be commercially, commercially collected and applied? Could it be stored and applied at advantageous times? Are there any predictors to when aspen seeds actually set? And I actually messaged you this question. So if you need to reread it, you can. Yeah, uh, those are all, all great questions. Um, I'll start out with what we know about the seed itself. There's been some work um, done back in, in the 70s and 80s that showed that seed, um, seed, seed viability in the field can, uh, can last anywhere from a couple weeks to maybe three, four weeks in the field. Um, so there's not, not a very large time. It's certainly not lasting over like a, a winter, for example, or it lasting in the seed bank. So it really has to germinate that, that year. Um, however, seed can be stored for much, much longer in controlled conditions, such as in a, a fridge or a freezer. I haven't done this myself, but there's plenty of people here at USU, like Karen Mock, I'm doing work but with collecting seed um, naturally and storing it and then growing it in greenhouses. Um, and so, see, yeah, seed can last for much longer um, in, in controlled environments. And I think yeah, that, that's a great, great area of future work. That's or it's been we work on currently is to use naturally collected seed to grow in greenhouses and then put that on out on the landscape. Um, there's another question in that about what controls seeding in aspen trees. Um, one or there's several hypotheses, I guess. One could be that it's smoke triggered. Um, and so that fires somehow, yeah, smoke particles in the air that then that the following year aspen seed, aspen trees seed. It could also be stress related. Um, so drought induced seeding, sort of a last, last ditch effort to put out a bunch of seeds. Um, but yeah, like, like I mentioned, we really don't know a ton and uh, these are just sort of hypotheses that should, should be tested and it's an exciting area in the future. Thank you. Do you think it would be possible for you to give us a quick overview of telling the differences between um, a sucker and an actual seedling sprout. Sure, yeah. Um, I guess the, the first important thing is that 
there's kind of a, a short window of time when you can even tell just, just visually, probably a couple of years, two or three years after which um, it, it's harder to do visually and you need more intensive techniques like, like DNA testing, which are very expensive and time consuming. But in, in this initial period of maybe one or two years after a fire, for example, um, there's, so yeah, lots of different ways to tell. Um, the most easy one is if, if the seedling in question is in an area with, with no pre-fire aspen. So if you can verify beyond a reasonable doubt that there, were, there was no aspen trees pr prior to the fire, um, then it's a pretty good, good way to tell. Um, seedlings have, have cotyledons when they first come up and germinate from the seed. Um, and then also their first set of true leaves, and both of these are, are opposite. So that on the stem, they both come out at the same location on the stem. Whereas suckers and all, all subsequent leaves on, on aspen seedlings are, are, are alternate. So the leaves alternate on the stem. And so this can be a really good way um, to tell a seedling and that it'll have little bud scars or even cotyledons if you see it early enough that are opposite and um, on the same, same point in that stem. Um, also seedlings grow much slower. And so um, it, it's not, I mean, uh, yeah, it's not perfect, but in, if all, all other things are equal, a seedling will be a lot shorter um, and smaller diameter stem compared to suckers. And so that can be also a good way to tell. And finally, seedlings often congregate around um, things like fallen logs or anywhere that seed could get caught. So in, in depressions, next to logs, next to rocks. And so that's just a, a good place to start looking, I guess. Um, and if there's a bunch kind of lined up against a log, there's a good chance that that was from seed that, that was deposited. And finally, the, the leaf shape in seedlings is often a little bit more lancelet and, um, and narrow relative to the, the more, more traditional familiar heart-shaped aspen leaf. Um, this can happen in suckers too, but al almost all seedlings have these more narrow, longer leaves. But yeah, I, I encourage you that we, I shared the link in the chat, um, or if you can find a way to get in touch if you wanna have that link again, please feel free. Thank you so much. Um, Doug, this one's for you. Could you comment on your observation or not of aspen seedlings across the Great Basin? Great Basin. Yeah, it's a really good question. You know, in our stands, um, <clears throat> most of the research that we did in the first study that I highlighted were in stands that hadn't burned. So reproduction there uh, was presumably almost entirely from suckering. These were stands that are stable, um, that wouldn't have this sort of um, seed environment that's favorable to you know, establishment and survival. Um, in our burn stands, it was a little challenging to say because most of those stands, you know, as Mark had just pointed out, it's best to sort of try to differentiate within the first few years. And the youngest of those stands were five years post-fire, the oldest were 15 years. So it was, a, it was a challenging prospect as well as just the sheer number of, of, of suckers, of course, that we were sampling uh, within those stands. Uh, but I think the, the, the work that, that Mark has done is really extremely valuable and um, it's, a, it's a great tool to use for, for future research that we do as we continue to do work in the Great Basin, so. Thank you. Yeah. Shelly and David, this one's for you. Is there concern with fencing and hinge treatments and a lack of seedling regeneration? Without the mineral soil, this would all be sucker regeneration. Yeah, we typically just have Sucker regeneration with our, um, I don't know how much our treatments. Yes, even regeneration we have already documented in there. But yeah, it's typically all sucker regeneration that we see with our treatments out here. Yeah, because we're already going into areas where aspen is needing some form of um, management to protect it or conserve that uh, recruitment. So they're already established out there. Um, we have had big landscape scale fires, but I did not even know that Aspen uh, could start from seed, but we've already said that the next fire that we have out here, we're gonna be out there looking for seedlings. <laughs> That's great. Thank you. Um, and the final question, unless anybody else has any others, Shelly and David, have you tried a hinging team consisting of a sawyer and a pusher with a long pole? I haven't. No, that's an interesting idea. Um, I can see some potential with that, but uh, no, it's typically just been, um, you know, we have 
um, multi-person crews where we each with our own chainsaw and working apart. Um, yeah, I mean, there's going to be other, I'd be excited to see if anybody else tries this and I'm sure there can be improvements to it, like anything else. So um, I'm sure there's more than one way to skin the cat. So it's, yeah, it'd be interesting to try. And we only have uh, two dominant conifer species out here that we've done hinging on, primarily ponderosa pine, and then secondarily would be Achilles white spruce. Um, so it's possible that some of the conifers in other states might behave a little bit differently and that you would have to tailor your hinging to those species in that situation. So. Well, thank you so much. And thank you to all of our speakers today. We really appreciate you taking the time to be with us and share your research and knowledge. I'm sure our audience appreciated it as well. And thank you also for taking the time to answer some questions. I'm gonna send it over to Darren. He is going to close it up for us today. Thank you. Thank you, Gabrielle. Thank you to all our speakers today. Great job. I believe we did nudge our knowledge a little further of Aspen. Thanks again to all the great presentations of that. Um, one of the speakers mentioned uh, that, I think that maybe it was Mark, that uh, one of the roles today here is reconsidering our previous assumptions. I think we might adopt that as a subtitle for the Restoring the West Conference. That we know a lot about Aspen already, but uh, it's based on a lot of assumptions and it's a worthwhile uh, exercise to go through and re-examine those assumptions. Um, and appreciate all, uh, all your uh, contributions to allow us to do that. Uh, been great to hear from Doug, thank you very much. Learning about snow pocket Aspen, that's a term that I'd never heard before. And, and the big picture of Aspen, especially in the Great Basin, it's really interesting to sort of juxtapose the Great Basin Aspen management with Black Hills uh, Aspen management. Thank you very much to, to you guys from the Black Hills. Really interesting, Shelly, hearing about uh, uh, how you avoid coppice uh, uh, treatments in the Black Hills. Again, an assumption I would have made about Aspen anywhere that, that I need to reconsider. And, uh, and, and especially when we might ought to reconsider it in some places here in Utah. Um, really enjoyed Mark's talk as well and learning about um, Aspen seedlings um, and uh, the graphics that you put together. And, and I've been aware of this for quite a while, but I really liked the way that you explained it. It was a fresh new approach. It's really helpful. Um, I want to thank all of our speakers one last time and our fantastic audience for going along with our virtual event this year. I'm sorry, once again, we could not be in person. We're hoping very much to be in person for 2021. Um, uh, we don't have a date chosen for but a, next October-ish is what we'll shoot for. And again, hoping to be in person next year. Uh, we will be sending a uh, evaluation of uh, the two-day event. We encourage you to please fill that out. And perhaps one of the more important parts of that uh, questions is, what do you think we should uh, consider for our topics for next year? Uh, we very much uh, take your evaluation seriously. And today's topics were based on last year's evaluations and previous year's evaluations. And want to say a special thank you again to Gabrielle Harden for doing such a great job of putting together today's events and to our uh, Restoring the West uh, Planning Committee and to all of our sponsors. Um, uh, thank you very much and we appreciate all your effort and participation and cooperation. Thank you all. We look forward to seeing you again next year. Bye now. Thank you.